This video is about a legendary folk musician and guitarist, one who didn't achieve any kind of notoriety until she was in her 60s. She was born Elizabeth Nevels sometime between 1892 and 95, no one knows for sure exactly when. She lived in an area that would become incorporated as the town of Carborough about 20 years later. She was the youngest of five children. She came up with her own name when asked on her first day of school, because up until that time, her family only called her Lil Sis at home. By the age of seven, she would sneak into her brother's room and pluck his banjo. She didn't know any better, so she played it upside down, strumming with her left hand and fingering with her right. She taught herself entirely, and by eight years old, she could play whole songs by ear. When she was around the age of 10, her brother left home and took his banjo. So Elizabeth quit school and began working to save up for a guitar. Much to her mother's frustration, she would stay up late strumming. Elizabeth would listen to the trains going by very close to her house, and she would eventually go to sleep to the sounds of wheels on tracks and whistles. This inspired her very first song, Freight Train, at the age of 12. When she was around 16 years old, Elizabeth married a man named Frank Cotton. The two had a daughter not long after, and it was around this time that young Elizabeth Cotton began to feel outside pressures on her music. As a new mother, she wanted to spend time with her child, and she also embraced the Baptist church. The deacons of her church didn't approve of folk songs, rag, and blues that she loved playing. Instead, they wanted her to play religious music. Cotton didn't enjoy playing that music nearly as much, and she decided to put down the guitar altogether. She would not pick it up again for 25 years. In the mid-1940s, Elizabeth divorced Frank and moved to Washington, D.C. to be near her daughter, Lily. She worked as a house cleaner and also picked up a holiday job selling dolls at Landsberg's department store. One day in the store, she noticed a little lost girl searching for her mother. The girl happened to be Peggy Seeger, and the mother was Ruth Crawford Seeger. By chance, Elizabeth Cotton just happened to meet one of the most famous families in folk music history. Ruth was a well-known composer and folk music specialist. Her husband Charles was a renowned ethnomusicologist, teacher, and composer who had been brought to D.C. in the 1930s by the U.S. government to help with relief efforts during the Great Depression. Charles Seeger was part of a New Deal initiative to help struggling urban and rural families relocate to government communities. Charles' sons, Pete and Mike, would become key figures in recording and preserving the history of American folk music, along with Alan Lomax and John Lomax Jr. Peggy Seeger would go on to become a well-loved folk singer as well. Ruth was charmed by Elizabeth's gentle manner with her children, and shortly after the holiday, Elizabeth came to work for the Seegers. The family loved her, and she earned the nickname Libba from young Peggy. The Seeger household, not surprisingly, was filled with instruments, and one day Elizabeth took a little break and picked up one of Peggy's guitars. Mike and Ruth happened to hear her from another room, and they came in and asked what tune she was playing. The answer was Freight Train. Although it had been at least 25 years since she had picked up a guitar, Elizabeth began to play again. With the added encouragement of the Seeger family and Mike's help in recording songs, she became a musician again. By the late 1950s, Elizabeth was making home reel-to-reel -reel recordings with Mike, and these would become the album Folk Songs and Instrumentals with Guitar. This was the album that put her on the map. Freight Train, the one she had written at the age of 12, would become Cotton's most famous song. Freight Train would go on to be recorded by Bob Dylan, Jerry Garcia, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Joan Baez, and Taj Mahal, among many others. To this day, even recent artists like Devendra Banhart cover this tune. By the 1960s, with the surge in popularity of folk music spearheaded by the likes of Woody Guthrie and Bob Dylan, Libba Cotton's career took off. She played clubs, festivals, and large venues all over the country. 
By this time, she was in her late 60s. Cotton's left-hand, upside-down guitar style wasn't the only thing that made her unique. She also picked with her thumb and index finger. Since her bass strings were on the bottom, this meant she would pick out bass lines with her finger and play the melodies with her thumb. The style actually became known as cotton picking. She was precise. Her playing was solid, but had an easygoing feel to it. And although her voice was noticeably more frail later in her life, it gave her a true authenticity. By 1979, she had recorded four albums with Mike Seeger, including a live album. In 1984, she was honored as a National Heritage Fellow by the National Endowment for the Arts. And in 1985, at the age of at least 90, Cotton won a Grammy Award for Best Ethnic or Traditional Folk Recording. Y'all gonna help me sing this. Elizabeth Cotton hasn't been forgotten. Syracuse, New York, where she spent her last decades, honored her with a memorial park and statue. In her hometown of Carborough, artist Scott Nurkin created this eye-catching mural as part of his statewide project commemorating North Carolina musicians. If you liked this video and want to discover more about artists from North Carolina, please hit that like button and subscribe. Thanks for watching!